You're probably familiar with their song, Do You Realize? But did you realize that the Flaming Lips have officially been a band for more than 35 years now? Yes, great intro, I know. Thank you, thank you. Over those 35 plus years, the Lips have seen numerous core members come and go, and perhaps covered most of what is the broad spectrum that is psychedelic music. And in a shonky music worst to best world first. I'll be ranking every single one of a band's full-length albums. So in this video, I'm going to be ranking 15 albums, not including the collaborative cover albums or the Heady Friends project. This is about Lips albums with Wayne Coyne as the primary singer. Some of those albums are absolute top tier in my books, but with that many albums and changes in the band's personnel and sound, there's bound to be some lesser moments as well. So now, let's get into my Flaming Lips worst to best albums list. As always, there's got to be one poor sucker at the bottom of the list. Now, Oxy Melody is not particularly bad, but it's also not particularly good. Most of the songs just completely wash over me with no real lasting impact. It's like a void of nothingness. Much of the melodies and instrumentation just feel lifeless compared to the albums that came before it. And then there's the lyrics. Oh, come on! Oxy Melody probably has the most explicit language out of all of the main Lips albums, but it just sounds like they're swearing for the sake of swearing. The worst offenders are How, which is otherwise one of the better songs on here, and There Should Be Unicorns, where Reggie Watts interjects with a monologue about unicorns shitting everywhere and paying cops so much money that they can retire from their shitty jobs. It's just some how do you do fellow kids tear stuff. It feels like they weren't trying too hard on this album, yet at the same time the band often tries too hard. The opening title track, which is an instrumental and the shortest track on the album, is better than most or all of these songs, and it's still nearly three minutes long, which may suggest why the whole thing is a bit of a chore to listen to. The early trio of Coyne, Michael Ivans and drummer Richard English introduced the Flaming Lips with a hokey brand of garage punk with some more psychedelic influences creeping in on their second album, Oh My God. On their third album, Telepathic Surgery, they continued to build on that by making it noticeably worse. The album was originally planned to just be an album length sound collage. The final product does have a 20 minute sound collage of sorts on it called Hells Angels Cracker Factory, but it's really more like an extended jam with a few other random recordings spliced in. And coming from a group of musos that were pretty average at their respective instruments, something that Coyne himself hasn't been afraid to admit, it's not even close to being worth that time. The album is mostly just the band's then usual hard rockers, which still managed to be fun but were pretty run of the mill at that point, and much of the attempts to get experimental just feel contrived. Who knows if they ever would have gotten out of this creative hole had Jonathan Donahue and Dave Fridman not stepped in shortly after. The 1986 debut Flaming Lips album is undoubtedly the least psychedelic one of them all, which is strange because their 1984 self-titled EP is pretty kooky. Some songs like Charlie Manson Blues and the sprawling Jesus Shootin' Heroin do retain the kookiness of that EP, but for the most part, here it is. <laughs> is like post-punk without as much of its usual sharp edges, but certainly retaining a reckless nature. Very reckless, in fact. After all, this is still the same early Lips lineup behind Telepathic Surgery. But the musical flaws on this album give it a certain charm, I guess. There is something fascinating about the album that probably comes from the juxtaposition between it and most of the Lips albums that followed. It's certainly a more consistent record than Telepathic, but if the band didn't have the career trajectory that they had, then I doubt that this album would have spread very far outside of Oklahoma. While it still doesn't beat any of the better known Lips albums, oh my god! does manage to be pretty solid. It still carries over that scrappy southern fried feel from Here It Is, but the more raw songs sound even more energetic and confident, and tracks like Maximum Dream for Evil Knievel and The Ceiling is Bendin spice up the approach with their trippier influences becoming more prominent. It's certainly not without some fucking around, with O to CC Part 1 basically just being a song by the band Poison played in reverse. 
but the songs Love Your Brain and <gasps> One Million Billionth of a Millisecond on a Sunday Morning give the first major glimpses at Coyne's more mature songwriting potential. Love Your Brain really brings the sort of lyrics about human existence and mortality that would soon become a Coyne trademark. Then the band starts smashing the piano that they played the song on and you realise yeah, this is definitely early Flaming Lips. From this album onwards, these are the Lips albums that I would probably recommend to most people who wanted to get into this band. I've never had access to four CD players at one time in my life, or even had four friends that also listened to the Lips. So I had to listen to Zyreka the boring way, that is downloading the album and mixing all four parts of each song as a synchronised stereo mix. Without tweaking it much beyond that, since the way I see it, all these tracks were made to be heard. Though actually, I did leave out one of the tracks, specifically the one on How Will We Know, that's just I'll take being a cop out if it means I can keep my sense of hearing and my sanity. So this meant that I had more focus on the songs themselves rather than the listening experience. And these songs are... alright. It certainly has plenty of similarities to the Soft Bulletin, but on Zyreka it feels like the band and Dave Fridman were playing the recording studio as an instrument rather than simply using the production to enhance the performances. This has a great effect on the skull-rattling jam March of the Rotten Vegetables, as well as the songs like Riding to Work in the Year 2025 that do have memorable tunes behind them, but the rest of them are generally just, like I said, alright. Whereas A Machine in India is 10 minutes of bugger all. Unless you like hearing Wayne Coyne singing about vaginas. Okay, mate. I can respect the effort they were putting into their work and the experimental approaches they took around this time, but even so, I haven't gotten particularly attached to this album. Very few bands, other than The Lips, would have the ambition and creative energy to come out with a double album more than 20 years after the band's formation. And they even pull it off for the most part. There are some absolute rippers on here. You've got Evil, See the Leaves, Silver Trembling Hands, The Impulse, Watching the Planets. However, Embryonic is pretty far from perfect. Coin has said that he wanted to avoid the dilemma of choosing what songs to include on the album by just putting everything on there. But there's definitely stuff on here that this album could probably do without. Like a couple of aimless jams and interludes. I think it's supposed to be a concept album as well, something to do with ego and fear or whatever, but it just doesn't stand out in any way. Also, you've got I Can Be a Frog, which is hardly anything more than Wayne telling Karen O of the yeah, yeah, yeahs to make a bunch of animal noises over the phone. I'm not even going to bother constructively criticising that. Just, just fuck off. Fuck right off. Embryonic has some undoubted quality on it, but it's just arranged into a somewhat overwhelming format. <laughs> the fourth Flaming Lips album, and fittingly introduced a four-piece lineup with Nathan Roberts stepping in for Richard English, but more importantly, guitar technician Jonathan Donahue became an official band member, helping to push the band's music away from daggy dad rock and towards indie rock with more influence from old-school pop and folk artists like Neil Young, at least from what I hear. But Donahue's crazed guitar explorations add a great deal of noise to the proceedings, making Inner Priest Driven Ambulance sometimes sound like Americana filtered through a fuzz pedal. Coyne sounds like he was putting a little more effort into his lyrics and vocal melodies this time around, which is certainly welcome, even if he was starting to sing out of his comfortable range and his ability to hit the right notes took a turn for the worse. It's a solid group of songs, and certainly doesn't drag as much as Embryonic, though a couple of songs do feel like they could be trimmed just a little bit. In a Priest Driven Ambulance is a pivotal album in the evolution of the Flaming Lips, but in terms of their discography as a whole, it's just solid and not much more. <laughs> At 
At War With The Mystics was by proper introduction to The Flaming Lips, and it's not a bad album to start with because it showcases the wide amount of ground this band can cover. Its singles, The WAND, The Yeah 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 Song and It Overtakes Me bring some fuzzy stomping psych pop, The Sound of Failure and Vein of Stars bring the echoey existentialism, Mr. Ambulance Driver is some more stripped back indie pop, and Going On is even more stripped back, almost straight up folk rock. Meanwhile, on Free Radicals and Haven't Got a Clue, things get a bit goofy. A little childish, even. Haven't Got a Clue is one of the more pop rock things the Lips have ever done, which makes sense given it features additional contributions from a guy known for his work with Adele and Sia. Those two songs certainly aren't going to be for everyone, but I still like them enough. The best single word description of this album would probably be fun, which is probably the polar opposite of what the next album in this list is. I mean, fun in terms of mood, not overall quality. Otherwise, it would have been bottom of my list, you know. Yeah, you're moving on. <laughs> the Lips have certainly produced some more pessimistic songs over the years, but their 2013 album, The Terror, stands alone in being fully bleak. Built on a cold, digitized sound dominated by deep throbbing synths alongside primal drum parts and vocals wallowing in a pit of reverb and despair. And the guitars, in the rare moments that they do feature, are choppy and wiry. The album is spread across multiple tracks but is mixed together as a continuous suite and most of the songs end with a separate, more ambient coda. Individually, the songs are pretty mid-range, but the full experience is very much an interesting one. At the very least, like on Embryonic, the band gets kudos for finding new places to push their sound so deep into their career, in a way that's largely effective. The second and final Lips album with Donahue and Roberts continued the blend of emotive songwriting with Donahue's chaotic guitar textures from Priest and Ambulance, but whilst that album felt a bit more laboured, Hit to Death in the Future Head is more the equivalent of a hyperactive child going at a faster average tempo, never sitting still and constantly throwing random noises and effects into the mix, and a few inevitable sugar crashes in the form of hazy acoustic psych pop on songs like Felt Good to Burn and You Have to Be Joking. Speaking of sugar, the melodies on here are sugary as fuck. Ginger Ale Afternoon in particular definitely sounds like it could have been an indie crossover hit to me had they tried to promote it as one. Unfortunately, the album maybe ends a little too soon, clocking in at just under 40 minutes. That is not including the 25 minute noise loop hidden at the end of the album. Plus, Hold Your Head isn't a particularly memorable album closer. But on the other end of the scale, you have the epic rocking out of Halloween on the Barbary Coast, as well as what might just be the most underrated Flaming Lips song of all time, The Magician vs. The Headache. The lead riff is so disgusting, and I love it. Come to the most recent Flaming Lips album, the follow-up to uh, Oxymelody. Despite that album, I was still curious enough to give King's Mouth a shot. Could this aging band seriously turn things around this quickly? Yeah, I guess they could. King's Mouth is a concept album made as the soundtrack for an art installation created by Coin, featuring narration from Mick Jones of the Clash and Big Audio Dynamite fame. Musically. The album is full of sweeping synth strings and synth choirs alongside Stephen Droz nailing the falsetto backing vocals as usual, and with the combination of acoustic guitar and programmed drums making a return in numerous spots, it does feel a bit reminiscent of Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots. In fact, you know what, in musical terms it's pretty much a Yoshimi sequel. But as it turns out, that's not really a bad thing. Similar to Yoshimi and a lot of their 90s and noughties output, King's Mouth brings that combination of bombastic production and performances with a childlike sense of wonder. But it still stands on its own enough. It doesn't feel like excessive nostalgia on the band's part. Even the song called Fideludum Beetle Dot manages to work. That song in particular has a pretty solid groove behind it. Even the shorter, more transitional tracks hold up reasonably well on their own to create a wonderful full-length album experience with some serious high points. The climactic section of Electric Fire gives me legitimate chills, and the song How Can A Head is a perfectly triumphant end to the album's proceedings. So, even more kudos to the band for being able to learn from their mistakes and come back stronger than they've been in years. 36 years after their formation, 
and it still looks like there could be a bright future ahead for this band. It actually took me quite a while to appreciate this album as much as I do now. Back in the day, when I decided I should give the Flaming Lips a try based on what I'd heard of them, like Kevin Parker aka Tame Impala citing the band as a major influence, I naturally started with Yoshimi because that's the album that I'd heard of the most. And if I remember correctly, I switched it off after four songs, then put At War With The Mystics on instead because I remember the Yeah 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 song being a bit of a bop. So yeah, like I said earlier, Mystics was my proper introduction to the lips. Back then, I think Tame Impala were the only other psychedelic band I'd listened to in depth, and I'd been set up for psychedelia to be like rock and roll, slathered in reverb, fuzz, delay, etc. So when I came to this album, it sounded more like a cross between indie folk and trip hop. I just wasn't in the mood for it. As a matter of fact, I was considering putting King's Mouth over Yoshimi in my ranking, but on re-listening to this album in full for the first time in a while, as I was writing this script, I found myself enjoying all of the tracks almost equally. It's just a really pleasant album. Coin's vocals and lyrical sentiments feel like they're a particularly major focus on the album, which isn't really a detriment, given that he delivers the best overall vocal performance on any Lips album. Don't know what sort of warm-ups he was doing, or how much editing they did to his vocals in post, but whatever they were doing, it worked to a T. After the full-blown synthesized orchestras of Soft Bulletin, Yoshimi's instrumentation feels especially understated, relying more on quirky keyboards that sound much more obviously electronic, but otherwise don't really try to dominate the sound. Though the album does get a bit more symphonic at points, particularly on songs like In the Morning of the Magicians and One More Robot Sympathy 3021, whereas Are You a Hypnotist brings some even more trippy synth textures. The one thing that was mostly making me consider putting King's Mouth over this album was the song Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots Part 2. It sounds like Wayne inadvertently walked in on Steve doing some warm-up scales on a keyboard and said, Hey, that could make a really good song. <laughs> and then he went and made it the entire frigging song. And then he told Steve to use the keyboard preset that sounds the most like a bunch of musical farts. And you know what would really tie this song together? Some high-pitched, ear-piercing screams. This song is a piece of shit. I'd rather listen to I Can Be A Frog on loop for an hour over this. I want to launch this song into the fucking sun where it fucking belongs. Fuck! But yeah, despite that song, I guess the good vastly outweighs the bad on this album. On a side note, I always thought Do You Realize was great, but not like a masterpiece or anything. But when I saw the Flaming Lips live in early 2016, and they played that as their final song, by the time they finished, I was just full of so much joy. It was fucking beautiful. Would absolutely recommend seeing this band live as well. It was a show full of balloons, wacky costumes, and a whole lot of jams. When Jonathan Donahue left the Flaming Lips to focus on his original band, Mercury Rev, the Lips continued in a noise pop vein with his replacement guitarist, Ronald Jones. But with double the effect pedals and his largely slide-based technique, Jones' sounds were on a whole other level. Jones is perhaps a huge reason why many Lips fans look back on this era of the band fondly, but really, most of transmissions from the Satellite Heart's greatness likely comes from the young Droz, who made his Lips debut primarily as their drummer, but he was already playing a ton of guitar parts himself, including the bulk of album closer's slow nerve action and the pedal steel-esque main riff of single She Don't Use Jelly. God knows how that, of all their singles, was the one that got the most chart success, but I guess that was the 90s for ya. You know, I've never been a big fan of alternative music, but these guys were And like the preceding album Hit to Death, beyond the grungy rhythm guitars and Jones's wacky shredding, you get some unashamedly, gloriously radio-friendly melodies. Not even particularly dampened by Coin delivering probably his worst overall vocal performance on an album. I mean, it's rather fitting for this album's general slacker aesthetic, but even Jay Mascus probably heard this and was like, Hey, I feel like you could have tried a little harder, man. But obviously this is still my third favourite Lips album, so I guess it doesn't bother me that much in the end. And who cares really when you have the anthemic opener turn it on, the doo-wop meets white noise of Be My Head, the stomping slow nerve action, that joyous rousing outro of Moth in the Incubator, and another song that I'd put in the running for the most underrated Flaming Lips song of all time, 
pilot can at the queer of God. The name's a bit dicky, but the song itself rocks. I do generally gravitate towards that fuzzy indie rock kind of stuff more, so combining that with the lips' usual zaniness is a bloody fun combination. This album's the follow-up to my third favourite Flaming Lips album, and it pretty much tanked any momentum the band gathered from that album and the moderate success of She Don't Use Jelly. That combined with Jones exiting the band and generally retreating from public life not long after would lead to their more expansive performances and albums of the late 90s. The album's lack of initial success could largely be a result of not deviating too far from the album before it, at least according to the band themselves, but Cloud's Taste of Metallic feels a whole lot more focused on those sugary, fluffy melodies. Mind you, they were still present on transmissions, just with more fuzz and crunchiness surrounding them. Believe me, I sure love some fuzz and crunchiness, but in the end, in my opinion, Cloud's Taste Metallic kicks transmissions to the curb on a song-by-song -song basis. From the opening track, The Abandoned Hospital Ship, the band already hit these glorious heights that transmissions perhaps doesn't reach quite as much as the folksy intro explodes into that joyous full band conclusion. And they immediately follow that with more fist-pumping rock and skyscraping hooks courtesy of psychiatric explorations of the fetus with needles. Jeez, save some bangers for the rest of the album, fellas. Thankfully, the rest of the album delivers a solid mix of walloping noise pop, more plaintive tracks full of existentialism, and others that may just be the hokiest shit they've ever written, especially when Coin focuses on inane lyrics about animals like on This Here Giraffe and Crispus at the Zoo. But even at its most cheesy, Cloud's Taste Metallic delivers. Admittedly, Brainville is a song that took me a bit longer to fully appreciate, but This Here Giraffe is one of my favourite tracks on here. Same with the closing track, Bad Days, or really excited version, one of my favourite Flaming Lips songs, period, practically abandoning any sort of alt-rock cred in favour of wholesome, old-school psych-pop vibes. Well, fantasizing about shooting your boss's head off might not fit most people's definition of wholesome, but you know, you get the idea. The more I think about it, the more I feel that without Dro's usual pummeling drums and Jones's heavily processed guitar squeals, much of Cloud's Taste Metallic would fit more of a genre like alt-country. Which is interesting, because that wouldn't really be my sort of thing. Or would it? I've never really heard too much alt-country music, if I'm honest. But who cares, this album is bloody glorious. That's all that needs to be said. Now, before I get to my favourite Flaming Lips album, not like I'm trying to save it for any sort of suspense or anything, you probably guess what it is. I want to give a shout out to a release that isn't one of the band's collaborative projects, but also isn't viewed as one of their proper studio albums. Probably because it's technically a condensed version of an even longer song. Specifically, Seven Skies H3, the infamous 24 hour song. Yes, that was a thing. And no, I don't have time for all of that shit. But thankfully, for Record Store Day 2014, they released it as a 50-minute album split across 10 tracks, and I listened to it the year it came out because I was curious what the band were up to in the then-present day, though later I found out it was actually recorded in 2011. But that doesn't matter at all, because this album not only stands taller than a vast amount of the band's 21st century output, but also is just a generally solid offering in the Lips discography as a whole. It's also possibly the most mind-melting thing the band has ever released, full of hypnotic repetition, droning, and other assorted moments of sensory overload. While there's a lot of focus on bleak ruminating over the idea of losing a loved one, there's also the bad trip army march of battling voices from beyond, the frantic punks taking acid of riot in my brain, and meepy morp, which is essentially just a shimmering wall of noise. Having originally come out a few years after Embryonic, it does share some similarities with that album, but ultimately the progression of Seven Skies H3 here flows a lot better. So if you wish that Embryonic was a bit more focused, with less I can be a frog and more evil, then this may be the ideal release for you. If I was officially ranking Seven Skies H3 in my worst to best list, I guess I would put it either 5th or 6th. I might rank it above King's Mouth, but I'm not too sure. Luckily, it's not a proper studio album, so the specific ranking doesn't really matter in the slightest. But here's a ranking that does matter. Number 1. And an album that certainly matters a lot. I guess 
once I got Yoshimi out of the way, softball to at number one was pretty much inevitable, wasn't it? But there is absolutely no shame in sticking with the large general consensus here. This album unequivocally deserves to be considered the best Flaming Lips album. Of course, there are plenty of people, perhaps just as many even, that prefer Yoshimi to the Soft Bulletin. And ultimately, I do respect that consensus as well. Plus, all the fucking around with the track listing of Soft Bulletin on the original releases probably did it a bit of a disservice too. I mean, race for the prize and waiting for a Superman twice? with remixes that are marginally different from the originals, and they didn't want to put Slow Motion and the Spider Bite song on the same album for some reason. I'm glad I wasn't listening to this album in 1999, because that is some horse shit. Thankfully, they've rectified that for a while now. So my experience with this album is with the track listing for the 5.1 Surround Mix Edition. All the songs mentioned are on there, with no duplicates. The only real downside is that they put Spider Bite song and Buggin' at the end instead of letting Sleeping on the Roof conclude the album, as Steven drove himself prefers. It's really the way it should end is sleeping on the roof. It should, that should be the last thing you hear on the record, you know. But clearly that hasn't brought it down for me too much, has it? So yeah, uh, Yoshimi's good and all. I mean, except Yoshimi part two, of course. <laughs> However, does that album have Droz essentially recreating an entire orchestra with his synthesizer parts? I wouldn't say so. The intricate instrumental layering, coupled with Dave Fridman's ever-adventurous production, is a marvel. Droz is being his usual musical freak of nature self, of course, but now you've got layers and layers and layers of that shit. But Wayne Coyne also pulls his weight, delivering lyrics that achieve a pretty solid balance between youthful quirkiness and heartfelt musings on life and the greater universe around us. Also, while his voice was still cracking a bit in parts, it's definitely one of his best albums vocal-wise, hitting the right notes and really bringing that emotional weight to his words. And Michael Ivins is also on here, playing bass. There are a few nifty bass moments on this album, in fairness, but also Droz may have played some bass as well, so... I don't know. The Soft Bulletin is like a musical equivalent of Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, full of wonder, sweetness, and bright colours, but not without some heavier elements. Like, what even was that boat scene from the original Gene Wilder movie? It, 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 it was a kid, supposed to be a kid's movie, right? Now, there's probably a hundred more things that I could say about this remarkable, beautiful album, but I spent nearly three months trying to finish the script for this video, and God knows how long the editing is going to take, or how long this final video length is going to be, so I'm just going to start wrapping things up now. I hope the fact that I've said nowhere near as much about this as my favourite Sonic Youth album doesn't make it seem like I'm underselling the Soft Bulletin, because Masterpiece feels like a perfectly natural word to describe the Soft Bulletin. Definitely still in my all-time top 10 favourite albums ever. Possibly even top 5, but like, I don't know, I haven't really thought about what my all-time top 10 favourite albums would be much lately. But regardless of where it sits in my personal ranking, it will always remain a masterpiece. And that wraps up my Flaming Lips worst to best list. This is Matt from Shonky Music signing off. And also, yeah, do yourself a favor and listen to at least the, the top four albums in my list. And if you're more well-versed in Flaming Lips music, listen to Seven Skies H3. And definitely make sure that you see this band live if you ever get the chance. Bye for now. The Flaming Lips, the Flaming Lips, the Flaming Lips, the Flaming Lips. The band played it on at the show. The band got down as they stood on the stage. The crowd roared like a lion. <laughs>